Good morning, folks. In this video, I'm going to talk to you about John Winthrop and especially would like to underscore some of the differences between William Bradford's writing on Plymouth Plantation and Winthrop's sermon, A Model of Christian Charity. One thing I hope you noticed when you read William Bradford's piece was the very frequent references to God that Bradford and his people really believed that everything was in God's hands and that everything that happened on board the Mayflower and upon arrival in the New World was because it was God's will. Now this focus on God, while it was also true for John Winthrop, who was a Puritan as well, can, comes out in a slightly different form in Winthrop's writing on Christian charity. But before we go into that document, let me tell you a little bit about Winthrop's background because it was very different from Bradford's. While Bradford came from a sort of modest farming background, Winthrop came from a very upper-class, well-educated family. Winthrop, too, was born in England in 1588, just a few years after Bradford. They came from the same period of time. Winthrop was the son of a lawyer and um, a woman, a mother, a woman, a wo <laughs> whose, wo oh my goodness, whose mother was also from an upper class family. He grew up on a large estate in England that his father had actually purchased from the King Henry VIII. That should give you a sense of how prosperous a farm and family they were. Also, Winthrop had many advantages. He attended Cambridge University in England, which is considered the model for Harvard. It is one of the most prestigious universities in the world to this day. So he attended um, Cambridge for two years and was exposed to Puritan ideas there. He was also married uh, while at Cambridge when he was 17 years old. Unlike Bradford and the Pilgrims, though, Winthrop was not a separatist. That is, he did wish to purify the Church of England from within, purging it of everything that harked back to Rome, and especially purging of it of all its traditional Catholic rituals. For a time, Winthrop thought that he would become a minister, but instead he turned to the practice of law. In the 1620s in England, there was a severe economic depression, and Winthrop realized that he could not depend upon his family for money. Also, at this time, the Puritan reformers uh, were beginning to take increasing action against the Roman Catholic Church, which, let's be clear, is the Church of England. So Winthrop felt certain that in order to remain a fighter for the Puritan Church, he might have to leave England. And in March 1629, he organized a group of enterprising merchants who were all strong, faithful Puritans. And they received a charter to leave for New England in 1630. They became known as the Company of Massachusetts Bay in New England. From the group of people selected to embark uh, in 1630 with this group, Winthrop was elected the governor. And for the tw next 20 years, he remained governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, established here in Boston in 1630. Make a note that the Massachusetts Bay Colony became modern-day Boston. So the founder of your land here at Suffolk 
was John Winthrop, a Puritan from England. Winthrop and his group set sail at the end of 1629 on a ship called the Arbella. They set out, and on the sea, just soon after departing, Winthrop delivered his sermon entitled, A Model of Christian Charity. Remember, this is a sermon, and it was spoken to his group of people aboard the ship with him. It is helpful to actually listen to the sermon as opposed to simply reading it. Perhaps it will have a greater effect on you if you hear it. In his sermon, Winthrop set out to clearly and eloquently verbalize the ideals of a harmonious Christian community. And he sought to remind all those on board that they could stand as an example to the world, either of the triumph or the failure of this Christian enterprise. Surely he wanted them to triumph. So in his speech, he had to find a way to unite the community and imbue them with a sense of love and hope for their mission. When a later Puritan looked back on Winthrop's death, he characterized Winthrop as the creator of the most perfectly selfless community and one of the greatest Puritan leaders of all time. So, what does a model of Christian charity propose? Let's look at it together. It begins, God Almighty, in his most holy and wise providence, has so disposed of the condition of mankind that in all times some must be rich, some poor, some high and eminent in power and dignity, others mean and in subjection. These are the first lines of a model of Christian charity. And what do they suggest? They suggest that we are all born exactly as God would have us be. It does not matter that some are born rich and some are born poor. It does not matter that some are born powerful and some are born in servitude. For it is God's will. And if it is God's will, we must accept our lot in life. Now, Winthrop goes on to say that no matter what position we are born in, we must always realize that we need each other. This is his third point in the paragraph that begins with the word thirdly. He writes or says, but I read here, that every man must have need of each other and we must all be knit more nearly together in the bonds of brotherly affection. He also says that it appears plainly that no man is made more honorable than another or more wealthy than another for any reason having to do with the man, but only for the glory of his creator and the common good of the creature, man. 
So all men are thus ranked by divine providence accordingly to a position of wealth or poverty. Because this might be hard to swallow, imagine if you are one who is born poor and must be in servitude to one who is born wealthy. Winthrop goes on to say that we are to walk together towards one another and towards justice and mercy. His overriding message that he reiterates again and again throughout the sermon is that no matter what station we are given in life by God, we must love one another and live with justice and mercy for each other. Now the message is slightly different from Bradford's because Bradford sought to instill the fear of God in his congregation so that all aboard the Mayflower would behave. Winthrop, by contrast, uses an edict of love to inspire the group of Puritans aboard the Arbella. His message is based in love, while Bradford's is based in fear. So as you go on to read A Model of Christian Charity, be sure to look at least at the first line of each paragraph. For it is in each line of the first paragraph that Winthrop reiterates his main point, that we must treat one another as each other's brother. We must observe and walk in the cause of community. He goes on to reiterate the rules of scripture regarding love. He writes that love is the bond of perfection. It is a bond that attaches us like ligaments to one another and it makes the work of us in life perfect. The goal of life, according to Winthrop, is that we love one another and thus live in perfection with one another. Now, if you just stand back and think about this message in your life today, you realize how appropriate and true it is. Often when I ask students about the meaning of life, or about what is the most important thing to them. They reply with words regarding love, family, and friendship. This is the ideal that Winthrop sets forth in his model of Christian charity. It is near the end of this document that he invokes the city upon a hill. And I just want to point you to that because that very phrase has become so significant in our history, especially for those of us who live in Boston. This famous passage is in the second to last paragraph of the document. In the paragraph that begins, now, the only way to avoid shipwreck and to provide for our pos posterity, that's, where, that's the paragraph, how it begins. I want to be sure that you know what the word posterity means, which is our future generations. How must we avoid shipwreck and provide for the future generations? 
Winthrop tells us. For this purpose, for this end, he writes in the second to last paragraph, we must be knit together in this work as one man. We must entertain each other in brotherly affection. We must be willing to abridge ourselves or rid ourselves of our superfluities, our excesses, for the supply of one another's necessities. We must delight in each other, make one's conditions our own. We must rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together, always having before our eyes our commission and community in the work, our community as members of the same body. Remember, students, we are knit as one in the image of God, each of us comprising one body, the body of God. This is the important message that Winthrop gives us. In spite of our differences, we all comprise one human body. And indeed, this is language that is used all over the world today, that we are the human body, a body of people. So towards uh, past the halfway point of the second to last paragraph, Winthrop writes, For we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us, so that if we shall deal falsely with our God, we shall be made a story of. We shall open the mouths of enemies to speak evil of the ways of God, and we shall shame the faces of many of God's servants. So you see, Winthrop says, all eyes are on us as a model of Christian charity. We must not shame ourselves through evil deeds or words. We must live in love with mercy and justice for each other. And that is the point of Winthrop's sermon, a model on Christian charity.